Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first USJC Reads event, Legacies of Heart Mountain. I'm Suzanne Basala, President and CEO of the US Japan Council, and I have the honor of moderating tonight's program. Now, today's session, of course, would not be possible without our sponsors. So I would like to offer our sincere appreciation to our newest platinum sponsor, Deloitte, who joins Fabit and the Ford Foundation at this level. I'd also like to thank our title sponsors, our Atani Foundation, Central Pacific Bank, Hitachi, Itoen, Mitsui, MUFG, Oryx, the Terasaki Nibe Foundation, Mr. Toshizo Watanabe, and the Toyota Research Institute. I'd also like to thank our signature sponsors, which you can see displayed on this slide. We are so grateful for their support in helping make programming like this possible. And to the many companies and individuals who make up our premier sponsors, we recognize their generosity. We're proud of this diverse group of supporters and we couldn't be here without them. For those who are new to us, the US Japan Council develops and connects global leaders to create a stronger US Japan relationship. Founded by Japanese Americans, we're an organization whose members believe people to people relationships are a powerful way to bring together leaders in the US and Japan to create solutions to mutual concerns. Now, let's turn to our program today, which is extremely relevant in the context of the deplorable anti-Asian discrimination and hate issues, which have gained more attention over the past months. Today, we'll look more deeply at the historical wrongs that targeted Japanese Americans and their families during the wartime internment and understand some of the generational trauma that resulted. Of particular resonance with the US Japan Council is a deeper understanding of how incarceration and war fractured families and their ability and the ability for many Japanese Americans to connect with their heritage. This has implications for many Japanese Americans today who are still finding new pathways to reconnect with Japan. Such stories make up the mosaic of much of the US Japan Council membership. The Japanese government has been a generous and visionary supporter of helping build these connections between Japanese Americans and Japan in order to strengthen the relationship, one individual, one family at a time. Representing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Minister Kenichiro Mukai offers the following message from the Embassy of Japan in Washington, DC. Good evening to you all. Being a diplomat has given me the chance to live and work around the world. In the weeks ahead, I will move from Washington, D.C. to Paris. And every place I have lived has given me a special memory. From my time in Egypt, I can still call up in my mind the sounds, the smells, the dust, and the heat of that exotic and ancient civilization. It is something I will never forget. And I have just as vivid memories of this country. One of those occurred when my wife Midori and I were part of the 2019 Heart Mountain pilgrimage. It was moving and inspiring and more personal than I expected. I went as a Japanese diplomat and I returned as a Japanese who shared an identity and heritage with those who were confined there 75 years ago. I will always cherish that July weekend in Wyoming. It truly is important to convey to Japanese and Americans alike the story of the Heart Mountain and the history of Japanese Americans. The Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation recognizes this. David Ono's film, The Legacy of Heart Mountain, recognizes this. And so does Shari and Higuchi's book, Setsuko's Secret. The stories that are told by Ms. Higuchi and the many stories of Hurt Mountain are also stories of the past that remain relevant today. Hurt Mountain is designated a national historic landmark, but it is more than history. And it is current in every regard. And it has become even more timely when the recent rise in anti-Asian incidents here in the US. All you have to do is look at today's headlines. Anti-Asian hate crimes 
nearly doubled in March. The message of anti-discrimination and prejudice has never been more important. Understanding Japanese American experiences adds so much to the depths and the culture of the United States. And this understanding is also important to deepening Japan-US relations. In this regard, I am glad that our embassy could help foster this tie during the pandemic through virtual storytelling, Kataribe, by the Nisei and Sansei. As I prepare to leave the United States, I will take with me those days I spent at Hurt Mountain. And I will also take with me affection and admiration for the Japanese Americans whom I met while in this country. I will stay engaged to foster exchanges between Japanese students and Japanese Americans. To each of you, I send my deepest gratitude for the example you set, for the values you represent, and for the contributions you make to Japan-US understanding. My best wishes to you all. Thank you very, there you go. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Mukai. And that message is just a reminder of how much support we've had from Minister Mukai during his tenure and how much of an ally he's been to the community. And we're gonna miss him very much and wish him the best in, in Paris. Um, and also that gave us a great scene setter. So let's go ahead and bring on our two guests for our discussion, David Ono, USJC council leader, an anchor for ABC7 Eyewitness News in Los Angeles. Among David's many impressive and award-winning body of work is the documentary film, The Legacy of Heart Mountain, which he will discuss today. We're also joined by Shirley Higuchi, who we just welcomed as a friend of the council. In addition to her professional legal career in Washington, DC, Shirley, cha Shirley chairs the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation and wrote Setsuko's Secret, Heart Mountain, and the Legacy of Japanese American Incarceration. So Shirley, uh, to get us started, I know you have a background clip about the uh, book to share. So can you please set that up for us briefly and then we'll, we'll enjoy that clip. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Suzanne. And hi, David. Um, I'm really excited about this presentation today. We are gonna see a background film that'll give you some um, history about the Japanese American incarceration that also accompanies my book. So if we can roll that film. I always knew that my parents met as children at a place called Heart Mountain in Wyoming. And my mother, Setsuko, always called it a place of love. It was only after she died, however, that I learned the truth. Heart Mountain was a prison. 14,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated there during World War II for the crime of looking like the enemy. Setsuko's secret is my attempt to understand the lives of my family, myself, in the complicated history of the Japanese American experience. Both sets of my grandparents immigrated from Japan. The Higuchis came first, arriving in 1915 from Saga on the southern island of Kyushu. They started farming in Santa Clara County, California. My mother's parents, the Saitos, came in 1918 and in 1923. They lived in San Francisco's Japantown and opened a store. Life in California was hard for Japanese Americans. State law banned immigrants from owning land and Caucasian neighbors often resented their success. The children of immigrants called the Nisei had to work extra hard to prove they were loyal Americans. Despite hardships, many Japanese Americans found the good life and made their way in society. Some became professionals and owned their own home, and others excelled in college. But then came December 7th, 1941. After Pearl Harbor, 
Wartime hysteria and racism intensified towards Japanese immigrants and Japanese American citizens. They called them spies or saboteurs, despite the lack of evidence. Then on February 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which allowed the military to ban Japanese Americans from the West Coast. Census records told the government where to find Japanese Americans. Signs posted in neighborhoods said they had just days to pack and leave. They could only bring what they could carry. My family was issued a duffel bag with their name and number stenciled on the outside. Shikata Ganai, some said, the Japanese term for it can't be helped. There was little resistance. They were first sent to assembly centers, which were temporary concentration camps on converted fairgrounds and racetracks. Some families slept in horse stalls and were forced to live like animals. This lasted a few months. Then the prisoners rode on a darkened train to one of the 10 concentration camps scattered across the U.S. My father remembers peering under the window shades to see where the train was going. My family was sent to Heart Mountain Relocation Center in Wyoming. Many prisoners wept when they saw their new home surrounded by barbed wire and guard towers. Wind and dust swept through the tar paper walls. The barracks had no running water, the bathrooms had no privacy, and the mess hall food was terrible. Summers were sweltering and winters were brutal. The prisoners repeated another term, gaman, which means endure. In spite of this treatment, many incarcerees yearned to serve the country that imprisoned them. They enlisted in the army and fought bravely in Europe and the Pacific. But others stood up for their rights. More than 80 men at Heart Mountain resisted the military draft as long as they were prisoners. They were convicted and sent to federal prison. The rest of the Japanese American community shunned them for decades. My parents and grandparents spent three years behind barbed wire. After the war, they, along with many others in the community, wanted to put the shame and the rejection behind them. They never talked about it. My generation called the Sansei could not understand why. Only after my mother died did I realize the depth of her commitment to preserving the memory of the incarceration. She inspired me to understand this part of my family's history in my community's experience. Over the last decade, I've been committed to safeguarding against the racism and fear that drove the Japanese American incarceration. It was my mother, Setsuko, and her secret that taught me, and hopefully you, that we can never relax in the fight for justice. Thank you uh, for sharing that, Shirley. And that was um, very powerful. Um, you know, I had a chance to read the book and I've been watching some of David's uh, documentary as well, but every time you see some of those images, it's just, it's just searing. So let's, let's get into the conversation. I know the audience wants to hear from you. Um, and tonight we're gonna start with really going back to the origin stories. And I'd really like to hear about what were the life-changing moments? You talked a little bit in your film, Shirley, about yours with your mother's uh, passing away. Um, but maybe we'll start with David first and, and kind of tell us a little bit about what experience, um, what, what encounters led you to um, do the film that you did, uh, the documentary about Heart Mountain. Then we'd love to hear a little bit of, um, more about your story, Shirley. And then how did you guys connect? Because I know you, you've been working together for years. So maybe I'll start with you, David. Okay. Well, I... Um... I took a very journalistic approach to, to this in the beginning, where I got a phone call from a woman named Patty Hirahara, 
And she had this amazing collection of photographs that her father and grandfather had taken at Hard Mountain while they were behind barbed wire. They even dug a dark room underneath their, their barracks. So they had this, this amazing story. And what I loved about it was it was such a thorough and big and beautiful collection that it um, uh, allowed me to get a deeper look into Hard Mountain. And that's what made me think about connecting with some of the folks actually at the uh, at Hard Mountain. And that's when I met Shirley and, and everybody else involved with this. And I think um, the more I found out it was beyond a news story. At first I was just looking at, into it as, as, a, as a potential news story, but it was so much more than that. And that's when after meeting Shirley and then Secretary Mineta and Senator Simpson and then the Ito family and then hearing about Stanley Hayami, which is one of the, the most incredible stories in the 442nd. And you know the list goes on and on. And then to see it in real life, it's like, I felt like this is a place that tells a much bigger story than just one quote unquote internment camp. This is something that tells a story that everybody can find something here. And, you know, I, my background is, is uh, I had nothing to do with uh, uh, this period of history in World War II. Uh, we came to America when I was a year old from Japan. So this was not part of our history. Mm. So I took that as a, as a journalistic approach, but then once I got to know everybody, it just seemed to keep pulling me back and luring back, me back. Even after we had finished the film, uh, there is just so much more to this. And there's so much relevance, especially into today. And I know we'll get into that part of the conversation, but it's just one of those stories that seems to grow bigger and bigger. And every day I seem to get and find out more about it that I find really alluring and fascinating. And I think the folks out there will too. That's really fascinating. I, I, I noted, I saw in your documentary about the, um, the photos that you talked about and how they, they were developed in a dark room buried underneath uh, the camp. It's just a, an amazing story. So I can see how that would pull you in, uh, but that's cool that it was more than a news story and it's really become clearly a passion for you as well. So. Right. Um, so Shirley, can you tell us a little bit more about um, your story? You talked about it a little bit in the film. Well, um, I really was uh, quite inspired by David's work um, mm -hmm. and his colleague, Jeff McIntyre, who spent a lot of time on this film. And it's a legacy of Heart Mountain. And he really focused on um, several critical characters that were in my book, uh, Secretary Norman Mineta and the friendship with Senator Al Simpson, um, we also dove into the whole resistor area um, and talked about Tak Hoshizaki, who's now on my board. And these are all characters in my book, along with, um, you know, a lot of the other characters that really form the basis of our history and what happened at Heart Mountain. But I, we have the saying, like six degrees of Heart Mountain, you meet one person that really gets into Heart Mountain, and you find out, you know, six more people that they know. So I would really consider uh, this a life changing moment, not a, only working on David's film, but also writing this book, it really allowed us to dig in have a great deal of passion and understanding that really sustains us as we move forward um, in this world. Well, building on that, Shirley, you said it was life-changing. How, how would you say that you're different from the experience of having written the book? Um, well, I would certainly say that I'm a lot more informed mm -hmm. and a lot more passionate um, I think about this issue. I mean, it was really hard for me to take over being chair of Heart Mountain back in uh, 2018, or and even when I joined the board after my mother died in 2015, because I was stepping into um, a matrix, um, a foundation where I knew little about. And it took a couple of years for me to really get pulled into it completely that now I would say it's clearly one of my life's passion. And I'm hoping David Ono agrees with me and is by my side doing this because we have so much more work to do, films, books, articles. So I would say that it was a life-changing experience that has really helped inform who I am today. Mm -hmm. Great, how about you, David? Well, I agree with, with Shirley wholeheartedly. I, I think when, when I listening to Shirley, when she's talking, I think that's part of it for me too, is when, when the closer you get to Heart Mountain and the more you learn about it, the more it pulls you in. And, and by that, I mean, you see its relevance to today. 
and you can't pull yourself out of it because you know there are so many great stories to tell from this this moment in history that we could learn from today and we are seeing it so blatantly in our world when it comes to asian hate when it comes to history repeating itself when it comes to politics today when it comes to how we treat minorities in this country and the animosity towards immigrants and i think there might have been a time maybe we could go seven, eight, 10 years ago, where you might get the argument that where's the relevance in all of this? And mm -hmm. I think in the last few years, sadly, um, that you don't hear that argument anymore. There is tremendous relevance to this. And then as a journalist, you are, you want to look away, but you can't, because it's so important of a story to tell, especially today, that you have to get into the minutia. And by getting into the minutia, I mean, understanding why this happened. That's the beauty of Shirley's book um, that, that my film lacks. I just jump right into what Heart Mountain is. Shirley walks you through the process of what it took to incarcerate innocent Americans. Mm -hmm. People need to know that process because we see evidence of that process today. We see it happening over and over again. And the fact that we don't teach these, these little chapters in our history that are so relevant and so important, the fact that we don't teach them Mm -hmm. And that's how politics continues to make the same mistake over and over again. Constituents out there, people out there are unaware of this chapter. And if I could add, you know, I grew up in Texas and I saw myself as a journalist. I saw myself as a kid who loved history. And I thought I read every book about World War II. Mm -hmm. Then I get to the West Coast. I'm by then a 30 year old anchor man. And I've already been anchoring the news in a couple of other locations. I'd never heard of this period of Japanese Americans being incarcerated during World War II. I'd never heard of it. And so there's, there's that moment of shame that you have for being uninformed and being ignorant. But then at the same time, when you analyze it, you think it's not your fault. If you don't know these lessons, how are you supposed to know that you don't know these lessons? It's the way we educate. It's the people around us. It's the way we carry our history and what we choose to teach and not teach. That's the fault. And then as a journalist, then you think the way to fix this is to expose these stories. Shirley is doing it with her book. I tried to do it with my film, but Shirley's right. There are so many other things to do out there in relation to what's happening at Heart Mountain and what happened at Heart Mountain that the efforts continue and the world needs it and the world needs these stories. I mean, I, I, there must be so many of the stories that just stay with you in different ways and come to you at different times. And I'm just wondering, like in the context of the last several months, is there a particular one of the stories or um, part of the experience of making the film? And then I'll ask Shirley the same question about the book that really sticks with you as, as in, especially relevant today. Well, it's a tough question because there's so many great ones. And then there's the obvious, there's, there's Normanetta and Alan Simpson. Every time they hear about Congress and their complete inability to make a deal, their inability to negotiate, their inability to say, let's find middle ground. And then you meet Normanetta and Alan Simpson, and they were on different, different perspectives uh, when it comes to politics. But being such good friends and understanding this chapter, they're able to find that middle ground. That's super important to today. But that's also a very obvious story. I think some of the more nuanced stories that we kind of pull out of, of Heart Mountain are like the book Light One Candle by Sally Ganor. And that was an, to me, that was an unbelievable book because he not only talked about himself being a Lithuanian Jew as a teenager trying to survive the war and survive Nazis and eventually survive being uh, incarcerated in, in Dachau, but he paralleled it with the, the person who saved his life who came out of Heart Mountain and how that person survived and his family was living through incarceration in the United States of America. And that was such an irony. Um, and I think it's a lesser known chapter, but I think it's a poignant chapter. And it's also one of those chapters that we will eventually do something much bigger with because it teaches a, a, a big story about Japanese Americans, their civil rights, but also what happened to Jews you know, across the world and anti-Semitism yeah. and how they're linked. That's a great point. And since so this is USJC Reads, if anyone, um, I don't have access to the chat right now on the YouTube, but it'd be great to put that book in the chat for people who want to follow up. Uh, Light One Candle, I think you said it was called. So. Light One Candle, Sally Ganor. Yeah, how about you, Shirley? Is there any particular um, 
part of the process that really is resonating with you right now? Well, I just wanted to riff off of David for a minute and say that, by the way, Heart Mountain actually acquired the rights to light one candle. And Sally Ganor, um, who was the Lithuanian Jew who was rescued by Clarence Matsumura, um, he was somebody who really believed in what we were doing at Heart Mountain. And my, my daughter actually delivered a scroll that was signed by all the board members at Heart Mountain, thanking him for that gesture. So his work will live on. And I hope to coordinate with David on some of the work that we're going to be doing around that story, given, given the book that we have. But, um, you know, I'd like to give a really big shout out uh, to my friends in Japan, uh, Dr. Uh, Nagai, who's the president of the Naga Nagai Foundation in Tokyo, and Dr. Sugabayashi and Dean Ichiyama of Josai International University, um, who are listening this evening. Um, and I'd like to say that probably one of the biggest parts of the story that I really have to thank the Japanese uh, embassy and the Japanese government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that Minister Mukai heads, is a trip that they actually supported me in um, that was the conclusion of my book in Setsuko Secret, which is I reunited with uh, distant relatives in Japan one of them being my grandmother's um, niece, who actually at this point is 89 years old and an enlisted assisted living facility uh, in Saga. And she didn't speak any English. But what the great thing is that the ministry gave me a translator. And what I learned in that encounter was more than I ever learned from any of my relatives in the United States. This Japanese woman who's 89 years old spent you know, many, many months with my grandmother after the war and my grandmother unloaded on her about how horrible it was and how she suffered. And the thing about the Nisei and the Issei, they never complained about their incarceration. So I learned about my family's experience and my grandmother's experience through this encounter that, that, that my, you know, a, rel a distant relative in Japan had. And so she started crying and I started crying and I started sharing photos, but she really hugged me very close. And it was through her that I really realized sort of the emotional impact that the incarceration had on my grandparents and my family. It was a real terrible, terrible time. But yet the Nisei and the, and the Issei acted like it was sort of a blip in the screen. And that's the reason why my book is called Setsuko's Secret, because nobody really talked about the depth and the range of that incarceration experience. Yeah, that's a very moving part of the book. I mean, the, there's a lot of great parts of the book. And, and, and I, maybe let's just talk a little bit more about that, because you talk in there, book, Shirley, about how, and I mentioned it earlier, the war, the incarceration, for a number, in a number of ways, really cut off in ways, people, Japanese American communities, access to their heritage and connection to Japan and their families' roots in Japan. And both of you have had opportunities, thanks to the Japanese government's generosity, um, to go back to Japan and, and to connect uh, with, with your roots in Japan. And I, I think I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I think that's actually a, a, an important part of building the relationship between our two countries. So, um, you know, Shirley, can you talk a little bit more about how that, um, in addition to getting information about your mom's experience in Heart Mountain, how did that change your view of yourself and your connection back to Japan and at, at your identity as a Japanese American? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of all in the book and, and it's all really there, but, that was actually the third time I've been to Japan, you know, and the first time was when I was an undergraduate student. I went there on a tour um, at, at the urging of my mother, who really wanted me to go to Japan. And then the second time was when my father was honored with the Order of the Rising Sun Gold Ray with Neck Ribbon mm -hmm. and all the Japanese students hosted him. And that was just a fabulous event, events, I should say. But, you know, it really those trips were not about me. You know, those trips were the first one engineered by my mom because you need to know your Japanese heritage to go, you know. And the second one was engineered because of my father's um, professional career and his students. And so this last trip, and the reason why I really need to thank Minister Mukai is because the trip was about me. Mm. And now it's like, I am, a, I'm totally going back to Japan, like probably in the next six to 12 months. I mean, I'll be back quite a bit, hopefully, and, and maybe teaching and doing book tours there. But when you, some, when you own something personally, and you own your own family history, it really engineers a different response than if you're going there for somebody else. 
And mm-hmm. so that's 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 how it affected me. I I just I really connected, I think, with Japan on a level that I couldn't have done going there for other people and for mm-hmm. other reasons. Mm-hmm. Great. How about you? How about your experience, David? Well, I I, I loved uh, everything about uh, my experience with USJC, and and I am so thankful that I got to go on the last delegation with Irene. And Irene is is one of those people that um, I'd known her for many years, um, doing you know, I'm seeing so many things for the Japanese American community, and she was seemingly at every single one of them. And she, shockingly, is a founder in so many different organizations. Uh, she, and, and so, I I don't. She was she had boundless energy, and then in traveling to Japan. Um, I found most impressive was the fact that she was always the first person to show up and the last person to go to bed at night. And she had that incredible strength. And I think, you know, I'm so sad that she left so quickly. I'm thankful, though, that I got that time to, to be with her and, and get to know her a little bit more. But I, in thinking about this event today, I, it, it struck me that um, even when she was at Jana many years ago, and remember the barracks that was dismantled in Hartmount and brought to Janum. She was, you know, the primary part of Janum at that time. And that barrack, it still sits there in Janum. In fact, I was able to use that to do a lot of my interviews for the Heart Mountain film. And it was just so appropriate that they pulled a barrack from Wyoming, drove it all the way to Los Angeles, put it in Janum. And it was, it was uh, Irene who was a major part of that. And so she has put her footprint in everything, but, but back to the actual, you know, the delegation and all, I I just found it remarkable that you have this opportunity to really immerse yourself into what it means to be um, Japanese of Japanese descent. And going back to heart mountain, what I found truly heartbreaking is I can't tell you how many dozens of people, that you heard say that they were ashamed to be Japanese because they were behind barbed wire. And we've heard the testimony over and over again. And in fact, I just recently did did a story uh, for Asian American uh, History Month uh, on redress, Japanese Americans gaining redress. And and I was watching some of the old um, testimony from 1981 in Los Angeles. And there was a woman her la- I forget her first name, but it was her last name was Ma- uh, Mass, M-A-S-S. She was actually incarcerated at Heart Mountain. And, and Shirley's nodding her head, yes. Her testimony was, was very moving because she was a younger person, but she talked about being so proud to be an American, and then the incarceration hit. And then she talked about being embarrassed to have Japanese parents and being ashamed to be part Japanese. And, and it was a classic example of how our heritage, in many cases, for the folks who were incarcerated, they didn't want to be Japanese anymore. And, and I feel like to compare that and then to my experience at, 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 uh, at to be able to go to Japan, where it's just the opposite, I was so proud to be Japanese. You know, it just shows you how dynamically different in that, that moment in history uh, made the experience of being Japanese American. Thank you. And Shirley, you talk about this onsei effect uh, in the book. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that here? Well, the sansei effect is a, a term that I coined throughout this journey of writing the book. And I have to safely say, writing this book is literally, not that I would know, is like being in psychotherapy. I, I would think it's very similar. I work, I work for the American Psychological Association, so I have an idea with that. Because you're sort of really digging into sort of the history and kind of why things happened in your life. And after talking to my colleagues, one of them, Daryl Kunitomi from LA, about similarities that his family had with mine, I realized a lot of that trauma that was embedded in the Nisei and the Issei really did pass down to my generation and hopefully not to my children's generation as much, but just sort of the confusion and the lack of information about such an impactful experience that your parents and grandparents had, yet you know very little about it. And so I think it really adds more than anything, a sense of confusion. 
and sort of inability to sort of reconcile certain tra traits that you see, perfectionism, workaholism, um, things that you don't really kind of understand what's driving all of that. And I go into quite a bit of detail in my book about the multi-generational trauma and the traits that I saw, not only in myself, but also with my family. So it's there, it exists, it's real. Um, and that's life. Yeah. Um, David, you talked about, I mean, and of course, we appreciate you talking about um, being on the agile trip with her and, and reminding us of her ability to be the first one up and the last one to go to bed. Um, Shirley, Irene's been such an important part of, of your journey as well. And she wrote the afterword of Setsuko Secret. And so I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about Irene, your, your relationship with Irene and, and her influence on and you on the book. Well, I, I know that Julie is gonna show a couple of uh, two pictures or photographs of Irene to give you some depth and range about sort of her exposure. Um, this is the one that happened uh, right after, um, I believe it was right after our grand opening in 2014 and after Senator Inouye passed away, we did dedicate a plaque to him at our memorial wall. And actually this memorial was built by the incarcerees. That's why it looks so old. Um, honoring those that served um, that were um, that left Heart Mountain. So this is Irene here in this photograph with Normanetta, Senator Barrasso, Doug Nelson, um, Senator Simpson honoring um, Senator in a way and Irene. Um, and I, we really appreciated her coming out. And then the other photograph I wanted to show everyone was actually our grand opening at the Heart Mountain. Here we go. There's Irene to my left and um, her husband Danny, the senator and uh, Norm and Al and others. So she was a real strong force in Heart Mountain's development, particularly because, and I said this in my book, is that um, you know she really supported the philanthropy behind building and preserving the history of Heart Mountain. And we need people out there doing that. And she said to me, I remember when I approached her about writing the afterword of the book, and this was a, like a really long time ago, it was shortly before the grand, after the grand opening, and she said that Doug Nelson, who's my vice chair, actually changed the face of philanthropy for Japanese American incarceration sites. But it was really Irene that showed that way. Um, so, you know, I met with her, you know, a couple of years before she passed. And I said, you know, I really want you to write the afterword to this book. And by then we had gotten a lot closer. We didn't know each other too well, like in the 2011 years. And she, she gladly did it. She was so helpful and so supportive. And, um, you know, I had a lot of plans for us, you know, after this book was going to be published and I was hoping to spend that time with her. And unfortunately, you know, she left us too soon. And but I have I have this book to remember her by. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I'm curious. One of, one of the things that Irene talked about her afterward also is um, talking about the next generation, which has always been so important to Irene. And you know, she talked about how younger, more diverse Japanese Americans need to know these stories, and especially, uh, or including, but maybe even especially those whose families didn't experience incarceration. And uh, so I'm curious if you could both talk about why are stories that you've told uh, through your film and the book, why are they so important to Japanese, Japanese Americans, and others who don't have a direct connection to the camp? Um, okay. Okay. Um, well, to, to use an, an overused cliche, it's not a Japanese story. It's an American story, mm -hmm. but that's so true. And I don't have, as I mentioned, any background with Heart Mountain and I find it so moving. And I feel like most of the people that go there that don't have a background with it feel that same way. And the message that is going on there is very much, it is an American story. It's a story about immigrants. It's a story about people coming to this country uh, for a better life. You know, they're willing to accept, you know, the, the contract of being an American and that is be a good citizen, work hard. And, and that, and so many generations of people accepted that uh, when they came over here and the vast majority of us all have this as our background. And so to lock people up because they are 
they don't look American enough. That is such a violation and that needs to be held on to and remembered. And that's why I think what Heart Mountain is doing is so important because it's continued to tell those stories and show actually how easy it is for this isolation to happen, to separate these smaller communities. I mean, we've, we've seen it recently with when it comes to, you know, immigrants coming over the border, when it comes to Muslims, et cetera. We see this repeating over and over again. And that's why the work that Shirley is doing and the folks at Heart Mountain are doing is vitally important, and especially for that generation of the younger generation to learn from. And I think one thing that kind of gives me some credence and makes me feel good is that in, in my few years that I've been hanging out at Heart Mountain and going to the pilgrimages, I see more and more people who don't have the background of Heart Mountain, yet they still, they're going there more and more often. They find something there that moves them and says, and say, I want to be part of that. And I think what they're building there right now when it comes to the Mineta Simpson Project, et cetera, is helping to tell a bigger story about civil rights in America, a bigger story about what it means to be American, and that it's on all of our shoulders to protect democracy, to protect these equal rights. It doesn't matter what color you are, if this is in your background or not. And then that is the bigger message, the more important message to tell. And we need places like Heart Mountain to help us tell them so it doesn't really matter if this is part of your background or not. If you go there, it will become part of you. And it's, it's, it's simple, but it's accurate and it's moving. You know, it's, it's, once you go, you'll feel it. Well, we certainly heard that in Minister Mukai's remarks. And um, I have not yet had a chance to visit Heart Mountain. I'm looking forward to have a chance to visit. And, and maybe Shirley, you could talk a little bit about the pilgrimages and experiences of that at Heart Mountain. Uh, and again, I, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on, you know, how do we reach audiences outside of the Japanese American community to tell the story more, um, and also within the Japanese American community, because as David pointed out, you know, he grew up in, in Texas and wasn't familiar with the story growing up. So, um, Shirley. Well, I think it, the, I cannot over amplify the power of place the power of place where the incarceration actually happened, the power of place where Native American Indians lost Heart Mountain before yeah. my family was incarcerated there. That is what inspires people universally, that experience of really experiencing what happened there. And um, what I really hope to do, and the reason why I appreciate uh, Josai International University calling in from uh, Japan, is uh, having the Japanese students uh, visit Heart Mountain. And we've talked about maybe we could fly into LA and we could stop at Janum and go through little Tokyo and then take the jumper flight to Heart Mountain and actually let them immerse themselves into that community. So I think Japan is a very ripe market to really understand what happened to their fellow kinsmen during World War II when, when unfortunately you know, we had World War II. The other area in which I think is important, and Suzanne, you touched upon this as well as David, is educating the younger population. And so I'm really happy that Heart Mountain received a National Endowment of Humanities grant where we'll have 75 teachers that will be trained up um, this summer and hopefully next that will go back to their school districts around the country to embed that curriculum in the stories of the incarceration to all their students. So those are two initiatives that we're really pursuing. Let's connect with Japan. Let's get them involved. And the second one, let's connect with our teacher community and get to the young people. And I think with both of those initiatives, we have a chance of educating everyone on this experience because you know what? It's going to happen again if we do not safeguard our constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of reactions have you had? Um, I mean, have, are, there, are there communities that you've had a chance to reach who have um, taken this story and been able to do something with it, especially in the current times? And I'm sure there must be some ways where you felt, you know, just connecting and telling a story to other people who've gone through the same things you have in your case, Shirley, who've had this on say effect. And, had these secrets in their family that need to be exposed. But have, do you have any other stories about or anecdotes about ways this, um, the doc, the film and the book have allowed other people to take action that's supported the communities? Well, I really, what I really appreciate about David's film and my book is the way that we equally gave exposure to the resistors 
mm. at Heart Mountain. And one of them is Takashi Hoshizaki, a uh, prominent um, botanist who sits on my, my board currently. And the bravery that they exhibited by standing up against the forces, the forces internally within the Japanese American community and the forces of the government that you know prosecuted them and put them in federal prison because they simply said, we're willing to fight if you restore our rights. I mean, you can't have it both ways. So the resistors are actually the cutting edge civil right activists that we now really hold up as heroes in our community. So um, I really feel yeah. that, that that experience was really important to tell. And David, do you, did you, do you have any comment on that? I love the resistor story. It's so important in, in today's world because I think the vast majority of the young people would not fight for a country that is incarcerating their family. You know, the resistors would probably be the majority, but back then they were the minority. So it's a really interesting study. I think another really important part of this chapter is when, when the whole redress movement happened and, they, and the United States government was like, we want to hear from you. We want to hear how this hurt you. And so in 1981, when these hearings took place across the country, it, it was a, um, a dynamic reckoning of sorts. It allowed a generation of people who don't talk to finally, and for once, begin to talk about the trauma. And once it spilled out of them, this country and the government started to realize we need to do something about this. And the reason I bring up this chapter is because we're looking at the same thing now with HR 40, with African-Americans and allowing them to speak and talk about generational trauma. The model from Japanese Americans in World War II is a solid one to look at when it comes to allowing African-Americans to get their opportunity to speak and for this country to start to recognize what, it, what institutional racism means and these mechanisms of uh, like Jim Crow, et cetera, uh, right. voting irregularities, et cetera. You know, it allows them to talk about how it hits them individually and personally, but also how generationally over and over and over again. And that's really where we need to go as a country is, is to begin to really understand what this, you know, generational uh, uh, systemic racism is. And, and the perfect vehicle to do it is, is places like Hard Mountain, and mm -hmm. what happened to Japanese Americans, because it's a microcosm of, of so many different entities in our country that we need to know about. And if I could just add to that as well, I mean, because I don't know if I fully answered Suzanne's question, but I think the life changing for what I love about Heart Mountain and the resistor story is it gives us space for the resistors to talk about what they experience and also their families to embrace, you know, what happened to their family members. Um, but also, I think another great thing is that, you know, really the African American community is really fascinated with this story as well. Mm. And I work with a lot of judges, a group of African American judges who are very prominent in Washington, D.C. and across this nation that has vis they have visited Heart Mountain and they relate to that story. And there's something very powerful when you have another person outside of the Japanese American mm. community as powerful as the judge standing up and saying this was wrong. Right. This was wrong. This is just unconstitutional, unacceptable and wrong. And that really helps support me and supports us in our community when that 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 change happens. And how have you seen that, you know, when you you've been doing a, a lot of talks about the book and, um, you know, having a, and, and it's in a time period right now, right, where there's so much more focus on anti API hate and discrimination. How has the way you're talking about the book changed? How has it been received differently? And is there something going on in the last months that surprises you or gives you some optimism as you've been thinking about these systemic racism issues and this, this history? Well, I really think that this book, and I do mention Dr. Satsuki Ina, who is a survivor of Thule Lake. She was incarcerated there as a child. Mm -hmm. I work with her kind of more with the community. And we just did an event with the American Psychological Association where I work, where we really were able to dig into the multi-generational trauma and actually a community that was very unfamiliar with the incarceration. I mean, the mental health community, psychologists in particular, are not familiar with this, which, you know, you find kind of strange because it's mm -hmm. trauma, right? Um, so, um, uh, you know, I think that that experience really 
really, um, you know, really was a, a very moving, um, connected uh, experience. Thanks. Um, David, do you have anything to add to that? And, and if not, I have, a, we were getting some questions in the chat that I can direct your way. So you can choose, but um, about just more going back to this idea of education and well, go ahead. I think education is, is really the key to fixing a lot of our problems in this country, mm -hmm. but there's so much resistance to change it. And, and mm -hmm. you know, if I could touch on just a little bit about uh, what, what Shirley said a second ago, and in and, and your question, the, the positives or the, where we're headed. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a dark time that we've been living in. There, mm -hmm. There's tremendous hate. There's this Asian hate. There's this whatever you want to call it. But the, for every action, there's a reaction. And quite often, there's sometimes a silver lining. And I think the silver lining in this is Asian stories like this mm -hmm. and Asian American stories like this are being heard more than ever. And I think places like studios are finally looking at this chapter in World War II saying, mm -hmm. we're willing to take a deeper look at this and mm -hmm. we're not gonna say no any longer because it's a bunch of Asian faces. They're starting to realize that they were, are part of the problem, that mm -hmm. they don't properly tell the stories of true Americans. And so I think, I think that's a positive thing, but we also have to take it a step further, education. Education is one of those things that it can reach everybody if we do it right. But we're seeing things like Texas, um, my home state. So I'm gonna say it, uh, 10, 10 years ago, they were trying to change their history books, trying to rewrite history mm -hmm. um, where their school board, which they aren't historians, they're just elected officials, run their chairman, I think at the time was a, a dentist from Bryan, Texas. And they were literally doing rewrites of their history books. Mm -hmm. And part of what they wanted to rewrite was the fact that they wanted to say Japanese American internment during World War II was necessary for their own safety, even though this country has already apologized for it and mm -hmm. said it was due to racism. Mm -hmm. But they wanted to rewrite that. And why that's important is because they are the largest vendor of history books in the country. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for a cheaper history book, you probably mm -hmm. find Texas, like let's say hypothetically, if you're in Indiana mm -hmm. and you're looking for a cheap history book, well, Texas's are probably the best deal out there because they make so many. Mm -hmm. So then, then Indiana's teaching this revisionist history, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And, and so they just have, there's a new controversy brewing about how they're creating laws in Texas to say specifically what you can and cannot teach. Um, and, it, and that gets more into the issue of they don't want uh, white supremacy. They don't want to, fo to focus on, on that. They don't want to talk about slavery in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And so there are now laws going out there saying you cannot teach this. If you mm -hmm. do, we're going to cut off your funding. Mm -hmm. And so this is a big problem. And this, this, these politicians who try to change history um, because it doesn't fit their agenda is largely uh, what continues to keep this systemic racism mm -hmm. going because people are unprepared for the truth yeah. because we haven't taught it to them. Mm -hmm. And we just, we gotta be much more truthful about these darker moments in our past so we can take these lessons and we could improve on them. And it's sorry if it makes some folks out there angry, but that's, that's the truth. That's yeah. part of what our deep divide is, is and this unwillingness to actually look at these dark chapters and, and teach them in a, a truthful way, as mm -hmm. opposed to a very American, a beautiful way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to comment that one of the initiatives that we do have, and I think there's a lot of overlap with USJC, as well as our Japanese friends in Japan, is the Mineta Simpson Institute, where we're honoring Norm Mineta and Senator Simpson's bipartisan mm -hmm. and collaborative relationship. And here, the, here these wonderful guys are here. Um, we're creating this institute where we could create a forum for the very issues that, that David had just mentioned. We want to develop best practices for government. We want to learn more about what happened to our Japanese 
friends in Japan during World War II with uh, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Simultaneously, what was happening to the Japanese Americans in the United States. Um, but the Minetta Simpson Institute, I think, will, will head us towards that direction. So thanks, everyone, for, for supporting that initiative. Yeah, that's terrific. Well, we are going to have to wind down. I, I saw some questions, and we've had this great conversation, especially about you know education. And it seems to be a theme in so many of the conversations I've been in in the last uh, few weeks, especially. So I just encourage anybody who has specific ideas of ways that we can reach broader audiences. Um, you know, hopefully in the chat, Dakota can put uh, you know some of the information about how to reach USJC, how to reach the um, Heart Mountain Foundation. We're always interested to hear people's suggestions and practical ways to to help get the word out to the right audiences. So. Um, this has been fascinating. We are going to have to um, start to wind down. And so I'd like to invite Consul General Takeuchi to join us. And she's the Consul General uh, in Denver uh, from the Japanese government. And she's been joining here with us. And she's going to offer some reactions uh, and some um, reflections as well before we wind down the talk. Takeuchi san? I think we need you to turn on your camera and microphone if, if you can. Can't. Okay. Okay, I can talk at least. <laughs> but thank you very much, Susan and David, Shelley, uh, for today's conversation. I was able to visit uh, Park Mountain in uh, 2019 with Musumukai, and I really felt the great impact of the place that only history place can have on people. And the desire to preserve the site and um, by using the site, such as interpretation center and um, uh, institute that you're going to make to educate people and to make this America strong as a democratic country. And there's so much things that we Japanese can learn from it. Well, it may be American story, but I like to emphasize that Japanese should learn more about the Japanese American history because we greatly owe to their history and their contribution to American society that how Japanese has been accepted here in the United States. And that surely contribute to not just American but the Japanese too, how we can be strong and we can build a better society with the knowledge and understanding of the past. So to me, learning about Japanese American history is really a Japanese story too. So I really encourage young Japanese to learn more about this history. Of course, whenever I turn your page or listening to others, or always find something new all the time, but it's okay. We are learning and um, to build better society together. So thank you so much for today's opportunity. I very much would like to visit again the Heart Mountain and read more of your story. Thank you. Thank you, Consul General Takuji. Maybe we'll both have an opportunity to go together on a, on a future pilgrimage. So, so I wanna thank everybody for being part of this program, especially thank Shirley and David for spending their time with us and sharing their insights. I also wanna thank our friends at the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, especially Julie and Dakota for all their partnership on tonight's program. And thank everybody for joining us for our first USJC Reads. If you haven't yet, please order your copy and enrich yourself with this story. The, the book and the film are both available for purchase at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center and the details are hopefully in the chat for you to, to find that. Um, and also I wanna encourage if you have any ideas of other books that you would like to see us explore together under USJC Reads, um, shoot us a note. We uh, look forward to your recommendations. And until then, I wanna say thank you all for joining us and hope you stay safe. Thanks. <laughs>